Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome. Thank you for attending today's webinar, a developer's favorite Scrum Master. Before we begin, I'd like to cover just a few items regarding this webinar platform. At the bottom of your screen, you'll notice a handful of widgets, mainly the Q&A widget, which you can utilize to submit any questions you have throughout today's webinar session. For viewing purposes, you can also expand your viewing window by clicking on the icon found on the top right corner of the slide viewer. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the Help widget. And lastly, do take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. Thank you. At this time, I'll turn it over to your presenter, Tony. Thank you so much, Olivia. I appreciate that. Um, as Olivia said, this presentation is going to be all about the Scrum Master and how they relate to the development team. Uh, specifically, we're going to focus on some of the traits that a development team can learn to value in a Scrum Master. Um, for that reason, the title of this presentation is a developer's favorite Scrum Master. Um, and we're going to kind of keep revisiting that phrase throughout our time here. Uh, we're going to be kind of pursuing and inspecting some of these things that make a truly excellent Scrum Master in the eyes of a developer. Uh, before I get going um, with introductions for myself, I will say that my colleague Lindsay is on the line with us, um, and she's going to be uh, monitoring the Q&A and kind of helping uh, facilitate this. So if you have any comments um, throughout the presentation, please feel free to drop those into the Q&A block, and Lindsay will either bubble those up during the presentation or at the end we'll revisit those because I'm expecting that we will end a little bit early today, which will give us a little bit of time for any Q&A at the end. Um, so looking forward to any participation. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tony Lunt. Uh, I'm an architect in the apps and infrastructure team here within Insight Digital Innovation. I've been with the organization uh, for a couple years now. Um, in my, my background is as a full stack developer before I joined Insight. Um, uh, primarily weighted towards the front end, but I've always kind of been a little bit of everywhere um, from a full stack perspective. And over the last few years, I've kind of moved into a role that focuses primarily on DevOps engineering and architecture. Um, and I'm also become very interested in how that plays well with Agile and how DevOps and Agile go hand in hand and some of the really interesting things when we pursue both of those things in a joint type of fashion. I am also a certified professional scrum master, um, but I but it, it's rare that I serve in that role. Um, but um, I do geek out over this stuff, and I'm super passionate about this. I, I, I love working with teams and figuring out more about how they work and the people that make up those teams. I'm a, I'm a people person, and so this is a, a really exciting uh, presentation for me to be giving. I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to have your time, and I really appreciate you joining. Uh, more importantly than myself, um, I wanted to show off some of my four-legged members of the family here. Uh, my wife and I have a couple dogs. Um, Dolly Potton is a name I give her full credit for. Uh, I also have a dog, Scully, and uh, two ferrets that share this uh, workspace with me, uh, Zoe and Kirby. Um, but they are locked away right now, so they will not be making any cameo appearances, hopefully. Um, so just to lay some groundwork for what we can expect today. Um, so we're going to expect observations based on real examples. So I am not coming to you as a scrum academic. Um, I'm not coming to you with a lot of quotes from the scrum guides or from a purely, you know, tactical perspective. I'm coming to you as a developer who has served on a number of scrum teams, and these are based off my experiences and some of the learnings we've had within Insight as a whole. Um, so hopefully I'm going to say some things that you agree with um, and that you can get a lot out of, and I might say some things you disagree with, and that's okay. I know sometimes we uh, kind of frown upon the idea of uh, disagreeing with presenters, and we kind of leave that kind of conversation to hushed whispers around the water cooler afterwards, but uh, please feel free to openly disagree. If you have comments, please drop them in the chat. I'd love to hear it. There might be cases where I'm just not right, or it might just be that we have a different perspective and we've had different experiences that have led us to different conclusions over our career, and that's, and that's great. 
Um, another thing you might expect from me is, is some nerdy fictional references. I do have a bad habit of uh, breaking into metaphors from pop culture or science fiction. Um, I will try my best to keep that under wraps, um, but I won't guarantee that it won't happen. And then finally, discussion. I know in this format, um, our discussion is primarily kind of relegated to the written form and Q&A, but we openly welcome that. Um, so please feel free to share as much as you would like. So uh, before we start diving into the meat of our presentation, I kind of wanted to open this up with a discussion for our Q&A just to make sure everything's working here. Um, so in one word, what is a trait of an effective Scrum Master? There is no, uh, there's many answers. There's no wrong answer, so to speak. Um, but Lindsay's going to be watching the chat and is going to join in with some observations from there. I will say, just um, while we're waiting on answers, there is a slight delay of about one second or so um, from my speaking to getting over to you. So um, if it seems like we're pausing during discussion points, it's just because we're waiting for everything to catch up in the system. But we'll try to keep things moving here. Uh, pretty smoothly. Um, the, I, I really like to open up with this kind of question because it helps get a good understanding of what kind of perspectives we're bringing here today. Um, and everybody kind of has their own experiences and things that they value in their team members, especially their scrum masters, if they've worked in that type of environment before. So I'm really looking forward to hearing some responses. So um, Lindsay, I'll go to you. Do we have anything from the chat? We do have several things from the chat. So we've got some really good comments um, of service, experiment, or communicator, mm. listener, guidance, teacher. Yeah, those are all, yeah. Those are all great, great responses. And I think that that kind of goes to show, you know, there's a lot that we can expect from a scrum master. Um, and it's a very challenging role, obviously. Um, and, you know, a lot of these things are things that we would expect from anybody that we work with, um, anybody on a team. And hopefully they're things that we expect from ourselves. Uh, but I think a scrum master particularly is in that central role within a team that it's very important for them to be able to be all of those things to the people on their team and to understand what the needs of the team are. Um, so we really appreciate that participation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and jump into one of the first kind of characteristics of a Scrum Master that we're going to talk about. And that is be a mentor and not a manager. Um, this one I'm going to spend a little bit more time on than the rest of the characteristics that we're going to talk about. Uh, because it is so foundational to everything else. Um, and I'm also going to be a little bit more rooted in the Scrum Guide than than than, than the rest of the presentation. Like I said, I'm trying to keep this as unacademic as possible, but I want to build a really solid foundation for the rest of this presentation. Um, so to get into what I mean by this idea of being a mentor and not a manager, um, let's look at what the Scrum Guide says. So the Scrum Master is a blank for the Scrum team. If you know it or have a guess, please feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, as we know, the Scrum Guides are fairly loose in their structure. Um, it gives you room to mold your team to the needs of your organization, but it is very prescriptive in regards to how the different members and roles within the Scrum team interact with each other. And so there is a very unique phrase that it uses to describe uh, what the Scrum Master should be to the Scrum team. And that phrase kind of Encapsul encapsulates a lot of what we're going to talk about today. A lot of these things that I'm going to be talking about that are more subtleties and off the beaten path are nested within this phrase. So, Lindsay, have we had any guesses yet come through? We've had several guesses. So we have had, let's see, one, two, three, four people guess servant leader. Um, and mm -hmm. we've had uh, another submission of shepherd. Shepherd. Oh, I like that. That is a really good answer. Um, it sounds like, um, and, and, and this is again, something where it's not that you're wrong when you say shepherd, that's very true. And I think that's a great, a great um, observation. Um, the, the answer from the scrum guide is that servant leader answer that we heard a lot of people say. Um, but I think it, it really does a good job of describing what the scrum master is to the team. There isn't a hierarchy there, right? This, the development team doesn't report to the scrum master. The scrum master is there uh, to support the development team. 
So a servant leader is a phrase you've probably heard before, um, but it probably can mean different things to different people. Um, leader does not need does not mean manager. Um, that's obvious, but um, a lot of times the scrum master role turns into more of a manager than a servant leader. And, and, and there's some danger there, which we're gonna kind of start to dive into here. But first off, just to level set on what servant leadership means, this is a quote uh, from, from the uh, Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership. Um, servant leadership is a philosophy and a set of practices that enriches the lives of individuals, builds better organizations, and ultimately creates a more just and caring world. I apologize for just you know, reading a quote off a slide to you, but I felt I saw this and I, I felt like it was such a perfect encapsulation of what servant leadership is. And this is something that's separate from Scrum and Scrum Guides. This is an actual definition of a servant leader, and it can apply in many different types of scenarios and teams. But at the end of the day, we're building... We're, we're building these teams out of people. And if we can, and, and, and so by focusing on that human dynamic and trying to build a better world around us, it's, uh, it, it often leads to a lot of the uh, characteristics that we would want within a team. So like we've, like we've been talking about, a scrum master's relationship with a scrum team is one of service and support. You, you should be able to go to a development team and say, does your scrum master support you? And the answers you get from that are gonna be very indicative to the type of dynamics that are built within that team. Um, it can be very telling if a team does not feel like they're supported. If they don't feel like they're supported, that might mean that their scrum master is acting more as a manager and a facilitator than actually a, a colleague and um, a companion while they're trying to deliver value in a product. Um, so let's ask the, uh, the chat here, what are some qualities of a servant leader? So we've probably all seen examples of servant leadership in our career, or hopefully we have, um, maybe not even from scrum masters, but just, just generally speaking, I'd love to hear what some people see in servant leaders from their own experience. I know that I've been very fortunate in my career, um, to have worked with many great people who are both managers and just mentors and who took the time to invest in me uh, as an individual. And I attribute any success I've had in my career, I attribute to that, that I've been given these, these types of chances. So um, Lindsay, have we had anything start to come through yet for um, qualities of a servant leader? Yes, we've had somebody say um, that, that, that a good quality is to be a good listener. Oh, absolutely. That's have, very true. They have empathy. Empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hold on to that word because we're going to be revisiting that. All right. Patient, teaching, a coach, mm. um, few more um, listening, few more empathizing. So very, very good. Oh, I love all that. That's very good. Yeah, it's in it. You know, you can tell from the types of responses we're getting there that people value being valued, right? You want to be heard. Everybody wants to feel like they're um, important. Not maybe not maybe important is the wrong word, but that they're that they're heard and that they're valued as individuals and contributors on a team. And when people lose that feeling, is when they either start to feel disenfranchised or they just leave an organization or a team. So um, those types of answers are really are are really crucial to everything else we're going to talk about today. So I, I love all those answers because they're all going to tie into some of these other points that we're going to be getting into. So there are some dangers of being a manager scrum master besides just the benefits of being a servant leader. So some of the dangers of a manager scrum master are, are one that it's, it's unfair to the scrum master, right? I mean, if you're a scrum master, you've heard all these things that we expect from our scrum masters. We've talked about all these, all these characteristics that we value in scrum masters. And you're also being expected to help your team grow as agilist and evangelize agile without the, um, throughout the rest of the organization. And that is a huge responsibility. And if you're also being tasked with HR, managerial, people manager type, type responsibilities, uh, then you're probably not going to be able to be as effective in your servant leader role to your team and to the organization. 
More importantly, though, it's unfair to the scrum team. Uh, the scrum team needs to be able to be transparent and vulnerable with their scrum master. And that's very difficult to do if that's a hierarchical type of relationship. You know, if we take the example of a retrospective uh, for an organization, for, for, for a team, those are super critical meetings where transformational things can happen, but that only happens if people who come to those meetings can show up and feel like they can kind of bear all their insecurities and all their concerns without being judged or without it affecting their careers or their image as a professional. Um, and if you're walking into that kind of meeting and reporting to a manager, in some organizations, you might not feel as inclined um, to be as vulnerable or as transparent. Or if I'm a develop if I'm a developer on a development team and I'm really struggling with maybe a skill that I'm being asked to learn, or I'm struggling with not agreeing with our direction for a product it's very critical that I'm able to go to my scrum master and very bluntly describe that. Um, and I've done that before in my past. I've been able, I've gone to scrum masters with things that I might not have felt as comfortable going to a superior to talk about. Um, and so if we break, if, if we do anything to build any sort of imbalance within these relationships, it's going to be felt within the team and at the organization at a much deeper level. Um, obviously, the feelings of the developer and, their, and, 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 and how they feel that they're valued is important, but those types of imbalances are going to have ripple effects throughout the rest of the organization. So it's really, really important that we're keeping an eye on this and being intentional about keeping this flat structure within our teams. So how does this Tony, happen, I do right? I have a quick yeah. question. I do have a Please. quick question if you are available for that. Um, yeah. So from the chat, we have, I have seen many Scrum Master positions as a hybrid project manager slash Scrum Master. What do you think about mm -hmm. this? Yeah, that's a tough one because one, one, it's tough because project manager can mean different things to different organizations and it, it often does. And I think what that, what a, a lot of times what happens what happens is organizations already have a waterfall type project management approach and they're trying to do agile as well and so they kind of shim it in and try to make agile fit that um i know Lindsay, in your in your career you've probably seen that a lot um with mixed success so i think it depends on what's being expected from a project manager um if the project manager is just more a matter of meeting organizational needs around documentation or that kind of thing or following a certain process that's probably its own problem i don't necessarily see that as being a manager but if a project manager is expected to be a people manager then that would definitely be a red flag from my perspective but lindsay if you're willing i'd love to hear your perspective on that i don't want to put you on the spot but no this is this is totally fine. Um, so I am a scrum master and a project manager within uh, within Insight Digital Innovation. And so I have had this dual role before at, at a client. And it is incredibly difficult to, to pull off when half of the organization is waterfall and half of the organization is agile. Um, so it's walking that fine line and figuring out when somebody asks you a question, what are they really asking and how do you tailor your answer to be wearing either your scrum master hat or your project manager hat. Um, I think it also, to go back to this question, like if it's truly a hybrid, like I think it's important to understand why is it a hybrid? Is it a hybrid because we are slowly making an agile transformation or is it a hybrid because the organization really doesn't understand the difference between a scrum master and a project manager and what those skill sets entail and what not only that skill set for the individual but then also like what that means for the organization. So just like any good agilist, it's always important to understand the intent behind something. Wow, that was a great answer, Lindsay. Thank you so much for chiming in there. I appreciate that. Didn't mean to put you on the spot, but 
Um, all right, so moving forward, how do these types of imbalances happen? Um, so, I mean, in some cases, it might be the Scrum Master misunderstanding the role. Maybe they're new to it. Maybe they got thrown into the Scrum Master role without a lot of education. So maybe they just fundamentally misunderstand. I mean, that, that, that happens, but in my experience, it's often because of organizational needs or dysfunction, kind of like we've talked about here, where the organization wants to become agile, but they don't really understand it. And so they just assume that the scrum master should be a manager. I mean, look at put put yourself in the shoes of of an executive level or higher person who's uh, looking at scrum and saying, okay, we do scrum. You're the scrum master. That must mean you're everybody's boss. I mean, that is a totally logical assumption to make if you don't know more about it. But that's where it comes back on us as agilists to educate the organization and help them understand how the team dynamics should be built. Um, so it's just kind of something to watch out for. And to help with that, let's kind of talk through what some of the symptoms of a manager scrum master might be. So one might be there's a lack of honest feedback within the team. So like we talked about before, team members aren't feeling like they can be transparent um, or be vulnerable. And so that's, that's definitely an obvious symptom. Um, or if teams are going to the scrum master for permission for things, um, that also um, can be a sign. You know, they might be going to the Scrum Master for guidance a lot, hopefully, especially when they're a newer team. But if they're actually having to ask the Scrum Master for permission to do certain things within their for their role, that might be a sign that that Scrum Master holds a little bit too much power within the team. Um, and then, the, or if the Scrum Master is performing HR duties, that's obviously a, an obvious one, but that's something you can look out for. We see it a lot where, you know, Scrum Masters might have to approve timesheets or approve time away and all these other managerial type things that we typically associate with a, with a manager. Um, or if the daily standup is a status report, if you go to the standup and everybody's looking at the scrum master and just delivering a status to the scrum master, um, that shows that we're not understanding what the standup is for. The standup is for the team to understand where things are and to communicate with each other. And it's not just for the benefit of the scrum master. In fact, as you probably know, if you're a scrum master on this call, you don't even need to be there at the standup. Um, but Observing behavior at these meetings can often show, um, can often reveal a lot of the dynamics that have built up within the team. So even if you don't see yourself as a manager, scrum master, it's good to keep an eye on like, what's the dynamic? How are people um, reacting to me during meetings? Do they feel like I'm a manager? And maybe you can take steps accordingly to, 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 to address it. Um, you know, when I think about great mentors, um, in, in, if, if we look at like Star Wars, for example, I said there'd be nerdy references here. I think I think Jedi Masters are are, are a perfect example of a mentor uh, because while they are there to guide, um, you know, they're they're Padawans, apprentices. Then they're also just friends with them too, and they're and 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 they kind of let them make their mistakes if they need to, um, but they're still there to help guide them without just giving orders. So if we move on here. Focus on the benefits of Scrum and not just Scrum itself. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, Scrum doesn't exist for its own sake, right? Scrum exists for real reasons, and the reasons are good, right? I mean, hopefully we all believe that if we're invested in this process. Um, but nothing is more frustrating than being told, we do this because the Scrum Guide says so, um, but that's often a knee-jerk reaction. So we see this a lot where it, when we're trying to adopt Scrum or help new teams onboard to this type of process, um, where we'll say, here's the laws that we follow, and you should just do that. Um, but that's not really a good way to meet people where they're at and understand their perspectives, right? So I'm going to say this as a developer. The reality of developers is that, uh, I apologize, our animations are not working on us. Uh, all right. Well, the reality of developers, right, is that we are very cynical people. Um, and I, I, I don't mean that in a bad way, but we're cynical and oftentimes we're cynical for good reason, right? Um, so we might have, the, the, the average developer has probably seen more unsuccessful 
agile transformations and they've seen successful ones. Um, they either in the current organization or past organizations, they've seen this happen before where executives say, oh, we're going to go agile. And then it, the process is butchered and it's still waterfall and everything falls apart until they just fall back to the old process, whatever that was. Um, so it's, it's really easy, um, for developers to become cynical, but it's on us as agilists and scrum masters to respect that though, and honor that and accept that they bring a new perspective to the team that can be just as valuable and not just to create a combative atmosphere where they feel like they can't be open. Um, so I know somebody mentioned empathy earlier in the chat, which I loved because that plays right into uh, what we're going to talk about here, where there's a power of compassion. Um, and I know compa th this all sounds kind of flighty, hoity-toity, but it's very valuable to think about this kind of stuff. Um, we don't often talk about things like empathy and compassion in a professional environment. And I think that's a shame because that's how you're going to bring out truly transformational relationships. So I've given talks like this before, and I tended to focus on empathy. Um, but as I started to kind of dig into the Merriam-Webster definition of empathy, I realized that's only half the story, right? Empathy is the ability to understand somebody else's feelings and, 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 and to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and understand why they feel the way that they do, whether you agree with them or not. Empathy is very powerful. It's very important um, in everyday life, not just in, in, uh, in, our, in our teams, right? But compassion is taking that empathy and turning it into action. It's not enough to just understand somebody's perspective. I can understand a lot of perspectives of people I disagree with, but have I gone the extra step to swallow my pride and then show compassion towards that person, meet them where they're at, where they're at and react accordingly? Because that's how you build true alliances and true friendships. And Agile and DevOps are all about bringing people in and enabling them to be the best that they can be. Uh, so if you're not using compassion on a daily basis, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult and you're dealing with difficult people, then you're going to have a hard time building those kind of cohesive teams and not just one or two allies here and there. Um, so that's something I really like to spend a lot of time thinking about is what can I do more to show compassion on my teams? Um, and it's, it's really easy when you have these skeptics on your team to just throw up your hands and say, we do scrum and scrum is scrum. So let's just do scrum. And this is what the scrum guide says, but that's really not a way to actually build any sort of meaningful relationship. Right. Um, so let's uh, moving on. Let's look at what some of these symptoms of a legalistic scrum culture might be. So uh, if the scrum master quotes the scrum guide as a solution to every problem, I mean, obviously, if you're a scrum master, you might be educating people and sharing the scrum guide with them. Hopefully they've all read it, but just quoting it um, as law on your team uh, probably is not going to be a great way to bring people in who are already skeptical. Uh, just because something's written down in a guide doesn't mean that every developer is going to just go along with it. They need to understand the real benefits. Or if team members can often be heard saying, I don't know why we do this, right? I mean, we've all heard this before in different teams where everybody's shuffling in for the stand up or a review and you'll overhear somebody saying, oh, I don't even know why we do this. Um, and I think that can be a sign that the real benefits of what we're doing haven't been properly espoused throughout the organization or if the scrum master is seen as a rule enforcer. So obviously, you're, I mean, this is kind of, you know, take it with a grain of salt. You are there to help facilitate proper agile processes, uh, but you're not just there to uh, force rules upon people. You're there to help them grow and to help the, the product succeed and the team succeed. So then moving forward, let's talk about some more characteristics of scrum masters. Don't misrepresent our challenges or successes. So what do I mean by this? A lot of times um, a scrum master can view themselves as being a public relations manager for the team. Um, but the role of the scrum master is more to help the team and the organization grow, right? 
So um, I've seen a lot where through purely good intentions, good scrum masters feel like it's their job to take cover for the team or play defense for the team or shield the team's challenges from the organization so that nobody has any misgivings about the team or the people in the team or the process. Uh, the, da the danger there is that the Scrum Master is also supposed to be helping the organization grow and helping the team grow. And so if you view it as your job to play defense, then you might not be, then you might be kind of getting in the way of some of those conversations that actually need to happen. Um, so if we downplay these challenges, we're kind of stifling the team's ability to address them, right? Or, you know, transparency is always better than false safety. Um, but one of the things that we'll often see, though, is that if there are deep, deep challenges within an organization, the scrum master or anybody on the team, if, if it's a if it's a if it's a high challenge type of environment, they may not feel safe bubbling those challenges up and talking about it. But you might have people on your team who have good solutions for those problems that they'd like to propose to the organization. But if the scrum master is playing defense and not bubbling these things up, it's going to be super hard for those people to get in front of the right voices within the organization to explain how, how these issues can be fixed. Or on the flip side of that, if you're the if you're just a rock star team and should be the model scrum team for the whole organization, the value from a scalability perspective is not in how awesome your team already is. It's how you got there. So, you know, to take a, a really silly example, if we were to go to a Olympic gold medalist and ask them how they won a race, they're probably not going to respond with, I went out there and I ran really fast and then I won and it was awesome. They're going to say, no, I've been at this for years. I've been practicing. I've had coaches. I've had mentors. I've had failures. I've had injuries. And here's how I've reacted to it and how I've grown. And here's what I'm going to do next to keep growing. And here's what's next for me. So it's more and, – and, and, and if you were wanting to emulate that, the value would be in those lessons and how they got there. So we need to allow our teams to be perfectly transparent and say – if we're effective, it's because we tried really hard and we had to learn a lot of really tough lessons and have a lot of really tough conversations within our team to get there. And so the value to the organization is being able to bubble those kind of things up, right? So some of the symptoms that you might have a public relations scrum master, and I apologize, our, our animations are still giving us some, some problems here. Let me see if I can bring this up. Nope, I apologize. Um, so some of the symptoms that you might have a public relations um, type of scrum master are that the organizational leaders are unaware of the team's challenges um, or the uh, scrum master controls all the messaging between the team and the organization, right? So I've seen that a lot where the developers on a team never actually speak to anybody else in the organization, of, um, at least not at a, at a higher level. Um, a lot of times the scrum master will be entrusted for delivering status reports or something to the organization to help push it through. Um, so hopefully if you're, if you're a scrum master who's not afraid of transparency, you're totally okay with the development team going directly to the organization and talking about the kind of things that are going on, right? Um, or if the team members no longer feel empowered to propose solutions. Um, so like we've talked about, your team members need to be able to call out uh, dysfunction within the organization, but also propose those solutions. And if they're not doing that, that might mean that they're not, that, that they don't feel like they're being heard. So moving forward uh, to these next uh, uh, characteristics of a scrum master that we've been talking about, Next one is cultivate a culture of positivity and new beginnings. And this kind of builds more on the last couple of things we've talked about, uh, but particularly how we've, how we've been talking about empathy and compassion, right? Um, so strong, knowledgeable scrum masters uh, will often naturally be viewed as leaders. So I've seen this a lot where um, it feels like effective scrum masters will naturally draw in the rest of the team and be kind of that North Star for the team for the direction they should be going. And they're seen as leaders and leaders set the tone for a team's culture, right? 
Um, so even though the scrum master is not a resource manager or a people manager as to, to put it more appropriately, um, they still are a leader on the team if there are effective scrum masters. Right. Um, so that gives a lot of extra onus on the scrum master to uh, bring a, a, a sense of positivity to the team, even when they're facing a ton of challenges and organizational difficulties, right? So um, just to make sure everybody's still with us, let's go ahead and drop something in the chat here. So what are some of the challenges that a scrum master faces on a daily basis, whether you yourself are a scrum master or whether you're a member of a scrum team, or if you can just imagine what, what some of those challenges might be, because we all know that we're all facing all kinds of waves and influences from all across the organizations and within our teams on a daily basis that make it difficult to do our job. So I'm kind of hoping to get some good perspective um, from other people on the team or other people on the call ar around what some of those challenges are. And I'm sure Lindsay has some of her own too. But um, if uh, Lindsay, have we had anybody drop anything in the chat yet? We have, so we've got a couple, we've got interpersonal conflicts, remote observation, dealing with blockers, miscommunications, um, from my own personal experience, top-down requests, um, sprint goals being in jeopardy. Jonathan, that's a really good one. Yeah, those are those are great. Um, yeah, I think you know a lot of these come down to people problems, right? Um, and I mean that in as kind of a way as I can. So, um, you know, we we all are people with different personalities, and we all show up every day to these teams. And 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 agile really challenges us to reach across and learn how to cooperate and build alliances with people where we might not have otherwise. And sometimes there's those interpersonal challenges we talked about. You're talking about top-down requests. There could be, you know, people in certain roles within leadership who don't understand what's appropriate and what's not and how Scrum works. Um, all these things all come down to people problems at the end of the day, whether it's whether we're talking about more technical things like sprint goals and that kind of thing, the root of it all is people. And as a scrum master, it's our job to remove blockers for teams, right? Um, and in, in spite of all of that. So the strongest tool that a scrum master can have is going to be that that empathy, right? And that, and that compassion. So even if you have interpersonal struggles on your team and people that just know how to push your buttons or make it difficult to, uh, to, to, to espouse proper agile practices, it's your job to show up every day and white with a clean slate and hope for the best for that person and, and, and build into that individual or individuals, right? I think I've even, you know, early on in my career, I benefited greatly, like I said, from a lot of really great, strong managers and mentors. And I know that, uh, you know, some people really had to swallow their pride and, and, and keep giving me second chances. And I personally have, have grown as a person because of that. And I could just as easily had somebody throw up their hands and not want to deal with that. So it's really powerful. Things can happen when we're willing to give people second chances, even when we don't feel like it. So treat every day, like a new beginning for your team. Even if you feel like your organization is never going to adopt this, your organization is never going to understand if you, as the scrum master come every day with an with an expectation that yes maybe this can work um then your team will naturally follow along with you as a leader and with your attitudes but if you become cynical and snarky yourself about how the organization is your development team will definitely go along with you because we love to be skeptical and cynical people as a developer i'm saying that so be the role model for the team even when you don't feel like it right so Scrum Master never stops giving chances, never stops believing in the value of each team member, and never stops trusting the value of what we're doing. So that's super important. And I think if, if we could do anything out of this, I think that would be the biggest thing. Have compassion and treat every day like a new day for your team. So I know that 
I've made lots of requests of scrum masters and I've kind of shared a lot of opinions, but I don't want this to come off as, as a gripe fest towards scrum masters by any means. So I kind of want to end this on a, uh, on a more positive note. Um, this will be the last characteristic we talk about here. So again, if you have any questions or comments, please drop those in the chat and we will get to that here shortly. Uh, but I do want to end this off on something that's very important to me that, I, that I'm, I'm very passionate about. So don't let me diminish your role. So me being a developer or engineer, you being a scrum master or some sort of professional agilist, right? So the there's kind of this weird thing in uh, that's formed in pop culture where we kind of view um developers in an overly romanticized way you know so we kind of imagine the developer who's hunched over their keyboard feverishly writing code and implementing elegant design patterns for maximum value or hacking the mainframe or whatever and for some reason as developers uh we've kind of built a toxic culture around that where we kind of oh, like like exaggerate and blow up the importance of what it is that we do every day right so technical versus non-technical, we've all had these kind of conversations where we're sorting skills or roles or even like maybe specific people as technical or non-technical, right? Um, and the danger of that is that some developers, when they hear that, they're hearing valuable versus non-valuable. And that's obviously not what that means. But if you have an overly romanticized view of what it is that you do as a developer, then that then then that kind of thing can happen a little more easily than we would expect. Where if we hear about, you know, compassion or empathy or, you know, anything about agile processes or concepts, we think, oh, that's that's just for the scrum master to worry about. I just write code and show up to meetings when I have to. Um, and and that kind of attitude really is dangerous. Because at the end of the day, um, if elegant code was the most important thing in the world, there would be many more successful startups. Like tech startups would be the safest investment any of us can make uh, beyond anything. Because uh, tech startups have great developers for days and have great code for days um, that could that should theoretically be all they would need to succeed. But as it turns out, it's how we deliver our value and the organization around that that's also just as important, if not more important. Um, so that's just, and, 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 and as it turns out too, um, how we do that is even more technical maybe. And so, so, so this idea of technical versus non-technical, if you hear those types of phrases being used within your organization, maybe push back and dig a little bit to see what people actually mean. When they say non-technical, what do they mean by that? Uh, because it might not actually be as valuable of a distinction as we think it is. Right. Um, Scrum masters are uniquely positioned, right? We can impact organizations or teams or individuals. I've already spoken about this, how I've benefited as an individual and my career has grown, which inherently has made my life in general better because I've had great mentors and managers and a lot of those have been scrum masters. Um, also teams, I've been a part of some great productive teams who had great scrum masters. I've also been part of teams that were not as successful. Um, but thankfully in my recent career, um, over the last few, few years, I've been very, very fortunate and blessed to have great, excellent scrum masters. Um, and then organizations in general can grow or, or fail as a result of the, uh, of the teams that make up that organization and the scrum masters play a central role to that team. So I guess in summary, what I'm trying to say is that you are awesome. You are valuable. You are money. Um, so please do not let, um, anybody tell you otherwise or pretend that non-technical somehow means less valuable. Um, so please keep being awesome, keep being you, keep being great scrum masters, because what you do is vitally important um, to our individual careers and to our organizations and teams. Um, so that is all I had today. I want to give sincere thanks to everybody who attended and for um, Olivia for, for um, kicking us off here and facilitating all of this. I know she's put in a lot of work into getting this all running for us. Um, so I, I genuinely appreciate that, Olivia. And Lindsay uh, for being here to help keep me honest and moderate the chat. 
Um, before we close out here, Lindsay, do we have anything from the Q&A or anything you'd like to say? Um, no, just again, a giant thank you to everybody for participating. Um, one question that we do have is, um, can you think of an example where you were shown empathy in your time as a developer and how that impacted you? Yeah, for sure. Um, I've been a part of some really challenging projects, uh, both in my recent career and also in um, b before this and other roles I've been in. and. Like I said, I'm a developer who is naturally skeptical and cynical, and I'm fighting that tendency every day. Um, so I've had some great scrum masters who have really been able to um, show me second chances, even when I feel when I when I've been a kind of a difficult member of a team, and um, or if I've had insecurities about the direction of a project. Um, you know, I've had a scrum master take me out for coffee after work before and just sit down and talk through things because they could tell I was struggling that much. Um, and those are the kind of things where, you know, like like I said, I think I think deep down what most of us want um, out of a job, obviously we want, you know, finances and stability and stuff, but we all want to feel valued, right? And I think that is probably the most important thing to us after our basic needs are needs are met as humans. And I think that is what kept me in some roles where I might have otherwise been tempted to leave, um, is having scrum masters who have been willing to take one-on-one -on -one time with me and hear me as an individual. So now I try to do that same thing. Even though I don't serve as a scrum master, I try to do that same thing for people that I'm on teams with. So. Fantastic. So we do have one more question that came in through the mm -hmm. chat. Um, looking for a book recommendation on for the Scrum Master on bringing challenging um, personalities or teams together or introspection needed as a Scrum Master. Not sure if you have any recommendations. If not, I've got a, a couple that um, yeah, I'd be willing to. Um, Great. I would love to hear though hear your recommendations. I'm like like I said, I'm not a Scrum academic, but I can tell you that um, from my perspective, I've um, I've read some some books that have helped me from a non agile perspective that still have a lot to do with it. Um, you know, there's the classic book of how to win friends and influence people. I'm not joking. That is an excellent book if you haven't read it, and it'll help you understand a lot more about you know the interpersonal dynamics between people. Another one that's more of a technical book um, is called The Phoenix Project, and I am so sorry. I'm double checking on the author right now. Um, the Phoenix Project by Gene Kim. Uh, he, uh, it's a it's a book that is all about um, kind of DevOps more than anything, but a lot of these same things kind of tie into Agile, but it has a lot to do with that human factor. But it's actually a novel, it's a fictional novel that's used to teach DevOps concepts. And a lot of that goes hand in hand with Agile concepts. But in regards to Scrum, to Scrum and Scrum Mastering specifically, I'm sure Lindsay has great suggestions. Sure. Um, so the one that I found super helpful was it's called Scrum Mastery from Good to Great by Jeff mm. Watts, and that's Jeff with a G. Um, so it uh, it really is helpful in understanding what you can do to to take your Scrum Mastery to the next level. Um, we have another. Um, thank you, Lisa. She just dropped in here. The Unicorn Project um, is her oh, recommendation yeah. as well. So. Um, I personally haven't read that one, but hopefully between these four recommendations, there's um, something that uh, will will work for you. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you so much for that question. Uh, Lindsay, was there anything else we needed to cover here? I think that's it. Um, no more questions have come into the chat. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. I really appreciate you kind of managing the Q&A. Um, that was very, very helpful um, and for giving your own insight. Um, so, Olivia, I think we turn things back over to you at this point. Is that right? It is. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. So that concludes today's webinar. We would appreciate if you took a brief moment to complete our survey if you have not done so already. A big thank you to the presentation team today and to the attendees. Thank you for the time and opportunity to come together. With that, we'll turn you back to your day. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody.